Well, since we are going to be talking about wisdom and word of knowledge, I found some uh, wisdom learned from children. Hey. <laughs> Sometimes they're wiser than we are. A snow day is better than a vacation day. Never squeeze your gerbil. <laughs> a slug leaves an easy trail to follow, but who wants to? <laughs> if you want a kitten, start out asking for a horse. <laughs> we don't have, well, maybe, maybe everybody in the room will relate to this one. Even Popeye didn't eat his spinach until he absolutely had to. <laughs> that was my favorite. Usually, you learn your lesson, but you don't always remember it. If it's going to be two against one, make sure you're not the one. The the spiritual gift of wisdom is, again, one of those gifts that we all should exercise wisdom, but there are some people that just seem to be blessed with that little bit more. God takes what all Christians should use and magnifies it in certain individuals. So it's a good idea to know what wisdom is and what it's not. Wisdom is the God-given gift of insight into the ways of God, into the understanding of life situations, and into the linking of the two. So in other words, a person with wisdom understands God and the world that we live in, and they are able to dovetail it together to be of most benefit for the body. Um, usually a person with wisdom is one who will give advice. And it's, I'm going to add this, and it's advice that's wanted. <laughs> Sometimes we get advice and it's like, okay. <laughs> But a person with the gift of wisdom just seems to be able to see a situation, hear about something, and say, I know what God would want with this, and then follows, follows up on it. Um, yeah. The word for wisdom is Sophia. You probably have heard that before. And it basically is the ability to speak with wisdom when it's found in the Bible. Um, <clears throat> wisdom, having it, is not in itself a gift. The essential idea is to be able to use the wisdom that we have been given to the glory of God. You'll find that as we go through every spiritual gift, it should always turn people to God and who He is. Not on a local body, not on the individual, but to truly exercise a spiritual gift, it will always go back to God. His glory. And so, we need to understand that while we are exercising wisdom, sensitivity to God's leading God will get the glory. Now, I found this interesting because wisdom is one of those spiritual gifts that everyone should exercise to some point, that the Bible does a lot of teaching on wisdom outside of the area of being a spiritual gift. And I was very hard-pressed as to, all right, 
how much do we all really want to go into this? So I've picked and ch chose what I wanted to do, um, but I'm going to give you enough Bible references that if you want to go into greater detail, have at it. Because there is a lot about wisdom. Um, for example, one of the things I'm not even going to mention, but I'm giving you the, the um, reference, is 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 13. Paul talked, I said I'm not going to mention that I say, and now Paul talked about um, that he didn't come with wisdom, but he came with the words of Christ. And he goes into a whole dissertation on that idea. Uh, but what I do want to mention is 1 Corinthians 12, 7 and 8. It talks about having wisdom with the idea of understanding and applying it to life. But it's the book of James that really gives us some insight into what wisdom is. In James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, it says this, and I'm sure this is familiar to all, to all of us. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So in James 1, verse 5, we can tell that it's not specifically the spiritual gift but that it's wisdom in general, asking for understanding and practical skill. In other words, the ways of God and how it applies. And as <coughs> you see in, the, in, the, in this verse, you can ask as many times as you want. There is... Just like God's love, God's mercy, God's grace, God's wisdom has no limitations. You don't get a message from God that says, no, you've asked one time too many, no wisdom for you today. <coughs> you can ask as often as you want for any situation that you're in. With the stipulation... If you're going to ask, trust that God's going to answer. Let him not ask with doubt. Being unstable is the idea. We read toss waves like toss. Um, if you've had the privilege of ever going to the seashore and you watch the waves and the fun part. Okay. <coughs> I'm a little sadistic, okay? For me, one of the funnest... <coughs> funnest? That's not even a word, is it? Anyway, fun for me is watching people get knocked down by the waves. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you should have known better. <laughs> oh, look at how many times he tumbled. <coughs> well, yeah, it's fun to watch, and I've gone through it too, okay? I just wanted... I've eaten sand more times than I care to remember. Um, but that's the whole idea here. There is no stability. The waves are going to win. And if you're not grounded and you ask for wisdom, the waves are going to win. You're not getting it. A lot has to do with our attitude when we come before God. Lord, I don't know what to do. You know all things. I need your wisdom. 
And God will say, sure, you got it. It says he gives generously, without reproach. Sorry, no. It's always, are you ready to listen? Here it is. Are you ready to obey? Here it is. If any man lacks wisdom, ask God, because he gives generously and never scolds reproach. He is delighted to give us the very thing that we want. We ask, can ask for insight, direction, his will. Um, a specific, and it's usually for a specific situation. Then when the next situation comes up, then you ask again. General, Lord, give me general wisdom just doesn't come into play because... You never know what uh, the world, the flesh, or the devil is going to throw at you. So it's usually always for something specific. The good news is, as often as you want. James, chapter 3, is another talk about wisdom. James 3, 13 to 17. Now... In this passage, James is just coming off all of the verses about the tongue and the danger and how you use it and how you don't use it. And he immediately goes right into wisdom. Wisdom. And this is what it says. James 3.13 Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. But... The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And so again, we're hearing what wisdom is not and what it is. James is saying here in verse 13, Who among you is wise? That word there means skillfully applying knowledge to practical living. And you're saying, Skip, yeah, you said that already. Yes, that is wisdom. If, when I do teacher training, I usually tell teachers, try to say the same thing three times in slightly different ways. Because it's usually not until the third time that somebody hears it that it actually sinks in. So, yes, I have said it and I'm saying it again. Um, so that when you walk out the door, you'll go, oh yeah, wisdom. <coughs> Practical living. Applying the situation to God's glory, for God's glory. Notice how there, I just did it again, one more time. So... Skillfully applying knowledge to practical living. The word understanding there actually means to be a specialist or a professional. This is the only time this word is used in the New Testament um, where it says, who among is wise and understanding. That word actually means a professional, a specialist, and what is it referring back to? Wisdom. The art of living. Yes, yeah, so if we get it together, one who is skilled in the art of living. Now, I am not going to go through all of the positives. 
I will tell you this, that if you look at that list of the positives of wisdom, they fall under two other areas in Scripture. The one is the fruit of the Spirit. Again, not a gift. <coughs> fruit is something we should all be developing. The other is found in the book of um, Philippians, where Paul writes, whatever is pure, whatever is reasonable, whatever is of good repute, and he gives a whole list, I usually forget halfway through the list, um, I believe it's Philippians 4.8, and uh, they're here, because at the end of that verse in Philippians, it says, think on these things. So, to maintain wisdom actually means consistency. Consistently thinking God's way. What I did want to cover in a little bit more detail is um, <coughs> what wisdom is not. Because right now we are living in a world that definitely lacks wisdom. They've thrown God aside, and we're seeing it left and right. So let's see what the origin or the foundation for worldly wisdom is. It says in verse 15 that wisdom that does not come down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. Earthly actually means limited to this earth. In other words, humanness. Seeing it from the human point of view instead of the godly point of view. Seeing it from the temporal point of view instead of the eternal point of view. It's earthly. It makes sense right now. But in the long run, could hurt. It's also natural. In other words, it's wisdom without <clears throat> spirit, or an unredeemed spirit, or an unsanctified heart. People of the world cannot have God's wisdom no matter how smart they may be. It takes knowing Jesus Christ as our Savior, repenting of our sin, coming into God's family, and having the Holy Spirit live within us. That's why we can ask, because he's right there. But the natural man understands not the things of God. That's found in the book of Corinthians. And so he cannot be wise. Oh, they may be smart. They may have ideas. But they'll never have God's wisdom, which is what counts for eternity. And then the last one, demonic. Demonic. Where's that wisdom source? It's from Satan himself, the father of lies. We're seeing that today. Some of the uh, Rosie's favorite word is uh, nonsensical. We're seeing so much nonsensical stuff coming out of, of our lawmakers, our government. Things that 20 years ago people would have said, that's never going to happen. How foolish. You can be a girl, boy. You can be a cat if you want to. <clears throat> Wisdom? Demonic. And it's getting worse. People who 
have wisdom seem to not be listened to anymore. World's wisdom. And here's the interesting thing, because if we go into verse 16, it says, for where jealousy, selfish ambition exists here, there is disorder and every evil thing. In other words, there's confusion, there's chaos, disorder. But the word there that, that we have in the Bible that says every evil thing, it doesn't mean it's bad. It means it's worthless. That's the word. Human wisdom is worthless, good for nothing. <coughs> and so James gives us all of this look into wisdom, what it is and what it is not. Again, I encourage you, you've got the reference, look up each of the words that I chose not to cover. I wanted to emphasize that fact because I usually forget things, okay? So I want you to know I chose this. Um, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. Go ahead and do a word study. See what wisdom really, really is. Now, the interesting thing about wisdom is you can have... No. You can be educated and have wisdom, but your education should not add or detract from wisdom. And on the flip side, you don't need education to have wisdom. You know what the difference between knowledge and wisdom is, all you educated people? Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not adding it to your apple and orange salad. <laughs> There's the difference. <coughs> you don't need education for wisdom. The bottom line, Wisdom is able to use <coughs> God-given information, God-given leading, God-given um, direction for God's glory. Word of wisdom, the next one. In my opinion, this, this, this gift is not consistent with any one person. In other words, anyone can have the spiritual gift of the word of knowledge at any time, and it may only be once. It's not like the word of wisdom is going to keep coming from the same person. I, I mean, this is just me because I couldn't find any scripture that would back up this thought. But I don't think anybody has word of wisdom, spiritual gift, all the time. I think it's something, the, the very nature of the gift is this. It's a supernatural revelation of some facts whether past, present, or future, which you could not get through an effort of learning, using your natural mind. You couldn't dig up the information. It just comes to you. Now, there's a reason for word of knowledge. One may be it's to protect the Christian. In other words, as an example, 
you meet someone and they seem great, seem good, what they're telling you seems right, and all of a sudden, in your mind, God says, that is a dangerous person, have nothing to do with them. That's word of knowledge. God is protecting you. Um, to a lesser extent, you can be sitting in a congregation listening to a speaker, and they are saying something, and they're very charismatic, and it's like really exciting to listen to them, and all of a sudden into your head, God says, that's a false teaching. Don't listen. Don't follow. Word of knowledge. To protect his people, God will give them a word of knowledge. It may be to show a person how to pray. A lot of times we hear in public prayer meetings and prayer groups where <coughs> someone will say, I have an unspoken request. In other words, they don't feel comfortable sharing it with the group. It's unspoken. God knows it and that's enough. And just maybe, in your mind, God says, this is what they need prayer about. No gossip, no talk. God reveals it. You know how to pray. Sometimes God will just let us pray in our ignorance. He knows, we don't. But sometimes he'll... This actually happened to me. Uh, when I was living in Hawaii, I, uh, I had a youth group for oh, three or four years. Um, all of my youth were Korean. Uh, it was with a Korean church that I uh, got put together with. And my kids were all Korean. Um, not that that makes a difference, but they liked me. They trusted me. And um, I was with them for like four years. So consequently, some of the young people in my youth group grew up and, you know, became young adults and things like that. And I got a call from one of the young ladies and said, you know, Skip, it's been a while. Can we get together for lunch? You know, she had left, you know, had graduated out of my youth group. And I said, sure. And we're sitting there, and there's the normal small talk. And all of a sudden, I look at her, and I said, you're pregnant. And her face went, yeah, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. See, we cut through all of the guessing and stuff. God put the thought in my head. It wasn't a question in my mind. Word of knowledge. And perhaps that's happened to you, where you just know something because God put it there. It helps us to pray for others. It protects us. And it helps us in helping others. God may put a need that someone has into your thinking. They haven't made the need known, but God gives it to you so that you can help. So that's the reason for having a word of knowledge. And again, I don't think it's a consistent gift. Um, to my... Oh, one more, one more thing. If someone has the gift of knowledge, they may be just talking. And what they are saying is exactly what you needed to hear at that time. This may have happened. This is one of the more common ways of the gift of, of knowledge, um, where we're just 
talking, nothing official, and the person says something that is needed right at that moment. Uh, perhaps you've done this for others, or perhaps it's been done for you. Nothing planned. Just the exact word needed at the exact time. Um, and so, we need to remember that this is a sheer gift of God. You're more likely to get the help, or to get the gift, <coughs> the closer you stay to God. So that there are less distractions of the world. Spending time in his word. Praying. You know, the things that help us to grow as Christians and we develop our closer relationship with God, he's more likely to give us these insights because he knows we can be trusted. Now, the best way to, to finish this up about word and knowledge is just to quickly give you some examples from Scripture where <coughs> word and knowledge came into play. Um... Now again, Old Testament, not officially spiritual gift. Well, yeah, it was because God gave them the information. But if you'll remember in 1 Samuel 9, uh, Saul, before he becomes king, is out looking for his donkeys. And the prophet tells him, your donkeys are over here. They're fine you need to get back to your father because he's going to be worried. It was a word of knowledge. It's like, oh, your donkeys are over there. You know, I know where they are. And it wasn't that he was looking for them. It's just when Saul came up to him, the prophet <coughs> answered. Um, to expose a hypocrite. Uh, remember that um, Elisha, through the power of God, healed Naaman, the leper, who was a Syrian, an enemy, because God was going to get the glory. And Naaman offered Elisha gold and silver and special clothes and all of this stuff, and Elisha said, no, you're not going to make me rich. I get what I need from God. So Naaman left. Gehazi, Elisha's servant, said, well, it's not right. He should have charged him something. He goes, gets some gold and silver and a change of two of clothes, and hides it away. And then he comes to Elisha, and Elisha says, oh, what you been doing? Oh, nothing. And then Elisha immediately says, was not my spirit with you when you went to the man and got the articles? Word of knowledge. It was exposure. Um, one that's very familiar to us is it revealed deceit in the church. Ananias and Sapphira lied about how much money they were giving to the church. And Peter said, it was yours. You didn't have to lie. But because you've lied to God, they, they were keeping it hidden. God told Peter. And Peter made the pronouncement. One of my favorites is um, Jesus himself in John chapter 1, where um, the disciples are just starting to be gathered. And Philip goes to Nathanael and he says, um, Nathanael, we found the Messiah. And Nathanael says, uh, it's Jesus from Galilee. Nathanael says, can anything good come out of Galilee? Um, derogatory, obviously. And... When Jesus sees Nathanael, he says, truly there's a man with no guile, no deceit, no hypocrisy. And Nathanael goes, how do you know me? And Jesus said, I saw you when you were sitting under the fig tree. There's different ideas as to what that actually means. But the idea is Jesus knew Nathanael immediately with, before he, they even had a conversation or anything like that. <coughs> These are all gifts <coughs> of word of knowledge. Um, Saul, his whole 
Conversion is a whole group of word of knowledge where God is revealing things to Saul, to Ananias, the guy that's going to pray for him. And so it's just information that God gives without asking, without studying, without prying. It's just there. And my belief is it's open to every Christian. But notice it's not something that you ask for. We can ask for wisdom. You don't ask for insight into people's lives. God will give it when it's needed to either protect the Christian, help the Christian pray more effectively for others, or what's the best way to meet the need of someone is just not quite willing to tell everybody they have a need. Who gets the glory? God. We're uh, into the Advent season, and uh, it's always exciting to celebrate Christmas and the Advent and Jesus' first coming. But because we are human and tend to forget things, Jesus set up a way for us to remember his second advent, his second coming. We call it the Lord's Supper or communion. Jesus set it up, and we have been doing it ever since then. And the whole reason... So that we remember Jesus' death until he comes. We remember the first advent. We remember the future advent. So if the men would come up, please.